Good morning. Since today is a special day in which we get special music later on in the service, I thought we would have a special treat in which I will tell you two stories, but I'm also going to illustrate a little bit up here. Oh, what's this? It's a chalkboard. Oh, really? How do you turn it on? Uh, you, you don't turn it on. Oh, but it will have illustrations. Oh, can I draw on it? Nothing's happening. Uh, it's not a touch screen. See, I will use this. What's that? It's called chalk. Oh. Okay. Uh, well, the story is once upon a time there were some people. And they went to a mountain. And at the base of the mountain, they saw God. And then some went up the mountain. There was one who went up. There were three also that were with him. And there was another one that was with him. And then came a cloud on the mountain. And after six days, on the seventh day, then God spoke to this person. And this person then received from God instructions. Now, that's a little lame, isn't it? Well, it's not in color. I didn't have any color chalk. Oh, okay. Uh, so, the next story is once upon a time there were people who went to a mountain. And one person went up the mountain with three others. And on the mountain, after six days they had gone up, and then on the seventh day on the mountain came a cloud. And the cloud descended upon the mountain, and from the cloud God spoke. And when God spoke, he gave instructions. You already said that. Yeah, it's the same story. Well, no, not really. Looks like the same story to me. Well, no, not really. See, because in this story, there were 70 who went, and then there was Aaron and Nadab and Abahu that went with Moses as the guy up here, and they went up and for six days they were in the cloud. It was on the seventh day that God spoke to Moses and he told him how Moses was to build tabernacles and Ark of the Covenant and all these instructions, along with, of course, he had gotten the two tablets of the Ten Commandments. Okay, so what's different about this story? Oh, this story it's 12 disciples who go to the base of the mountain. Jesus is the one who goes up with Peter, James, and John. And they go up, and on the seventh day, then comes the cloud. And from the cloud comes God's voice. And God's voice gives instructions, not about tabernacles and arcs and all that, it gives instructions that this, Jesus, is the tabernacle who will be the ark and that this is who you listen to. So it's sort of the same story, but it's different. Oh, I forgot to mention, guess who's also on this mountain? Moses comes to be on the mountain there along with Elijah. So, they're similar, but they're different. Correct. Oh, all right. So, and that's the story. There are two stories. They look very similar, but they're really very different. Okay, how do you erase it? Well, yeah, you can erase it. Okay, good. Where's my button to erase it? <clears throat> you use an eraser. 
Yeah, that's what I said. Where's the button? Uh, it's this. And you rub it, and then you erase it. Wow, this is really strange stuff. Okay, well, it's not very high tech, but it gets the point across. And now we have uh, for you a treat, since you got to see an old-fashioned way of telling a story. Grace, mercy, peace be unto you from God, from our Father and Son, Jesus the Christ. Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. These words from Jesus to his disciples as they descend the holy mountain cause some <coughs> puzzlement. Why can they tell no one this vision? I mean, this was a marvelous vision. Moses and Elijah, the glory of God on the holy mountain. And why tell no one? Because life needs to be interpreted. All of life needs interpretation. Life's events, life's experiences, and yes, even the visions of life need to be interpreted. Interpreted in what light? How is life to be interpreted? You see, human beings, we are notorious for never agreeing on anything. It doesn't matter what the event is, what the topic is, what the experience is, you put two humans together and they probably will not come to agreement. Just Look at politics if you need an example of this. In politics, you can have the exact same event occur. And what you will get is two completely different explanations, two completely different pronouncements. One will say, well, you know, this is all just cruelty. And the other one will go, no, 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 this is justice. Interpretations vary. Experiences, the same experience, can be interpreted two ways. You place me on a carnival ride where you were shot up in the air, or you were twisted around, or you were spun around, and then ask me about my experience. I will tell you it was horrible, terrible. I, my stomach was about to you know, leave my body. While the person right next to me might say, this was a grand experience. It was great and joyous. Interpretations vary. Jesus tells Peter, James, and John, tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead because he knows that left to themselves, well, interpretations will vary. Until, until they themselves are interpreted. And that will occur when the Son of Man is raised from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the event. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the event that changes everything. It reinterprets life as we have known it and life as we will ever know it. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, taking our sins upon himself, we were then freed from bondage. We were freed from our slavery to sin and death and the devil. In Christ's resurrection is now new life. New life now. We are given a new life existence. We are made new creations by water and the Spirit. We are now new beings to walk believing, where before we could not believe. We are now able to walk by faith, no longer living as the old creatures who are always doubting God's Word, wondering what it really means. 
Now we are new creations in Christ, and in Christ we are given the gift of faith and belief to live as believers. This is the change that occurs by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that when Jesus tells Peter, James, and John as they're coming down off the mountain, tell no one until it was a command to wait. Wait until you have been interpreted. First, you will be interpreted as betrayers, deniers, unbelievers who run and do not stay with Christ. In a nutshell, you will be interpreted, he says, as sinners. Wait, though, until you are reinterpreted as forgiven. When you receive the Holy Spirit, when faith is created within you so that now, by the Holy Spirit, you can believe and cling to Christ. You need to be reinterpreted as believer. Then you will be able to tell what you saw. It is this reinterpretation of those who saw that must take place before they can tell others what it is they saw. And we see this illustrated in just the life of Peter himself. Look at the story as we have it in Matthew 17 of Peter on the mountain. Peter goes up the mountain. The cloud is, is there. There's Moses. And he, like, Peter gets so caught up in the moment of glory. He sees the Lord transfigured. He, he then jumps to interpreting the event. For it is Peter that blurts out, Lord, let me create three tents here, three booths, three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He knows he has to do something. Why else is he there? He interprets that he is there in order to create these tabernacles, which, of course, was what they received on the original mountain when Moses was there, was instructions on how you will build this tabernacle so that you can come to the glory of God. And so he says, well, it's got to be the same thing. He jumps to his conclusion. He interprets that this is what it's all about and if not that, well, at least maybe I should be uh, build, building an interactive diorama of a visitor center so that then we can have a bunch of tourists come here and make a bunch of money. Something, Peter's jumping to some interpretation. But, of course, he misinterprets everything. And God will put an end to Peter's nonsense. While Peter is blabbing on about building the tents, that's when the cloud descends and they see nothing. That's when the voice booms out of the cloud. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. This is the voice that sends them falling on their face in fear. The fog of the cloud being symbolic of the very fog that is in their mind. And clouds their interpretation until they are given a new one. It is, of course, that word from the cloud, that word of God, that gives them now sight. For it is Jesus, this beloved son with whom he is well pleased, that come and touches the disciples. And he says to them, rise and have no fear. So that when they rise up and they look, they see Jesus only. From this, we then go to a second reinterpreting that occurs to Peter. As we read, it was the second lesson, the second letter of Peter, he now is telling of the vision. But by the time Peter is writing his second letter, something has happened to him. He has been reinterpreted by, of course, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Son of Man has died and be, been raised a new life. Peter, of course, in that time, has even denied knowing Jesus. Three times he has denied, I don't even know the guy. What are you talking about? But then the resurrected Lord must come to this crestfallen, this 
destroyed man. And three times it is the Lord who comes to him and says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter gets to answer three times, yes, Lord, you know I love you. It is this Lord, this risen Lord that comes to forgive Peter and to breathe upon him, to say, receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter receives the Holy Spirit so that now Peter is a new creation. He has a new life in Christ that he never had before the death and the resurrection of Christ. It is not the old Peter who was interpreting everything wrong on the mountain who writes this letter. It is now a new creation in Christ that writes and goes back to talking about his time on the mountain. He says, we beheld the glory on the mountain. We saw the vision, Moses, Elijah, Jesus shining like the sun. And what does he say? First Peter, or excuse me, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 16, he says, We were eyewitnesses of Jesus' majesty, and we received this honor and glory from God himself. But, this is important, but, verse 19, he says, we have something more sure, the prophetic word, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Interesting. What Peter, after the death and resurrection of Christ, interprets about his vision of glory on the mountain. He says, yeah, but we have something more sure. More sure than getting to see Moses, Elijah, and Jesus shining like the sun, transfigured in all his glory. Something more sure than that vision? Yes, says Peter. We have the Holy Scriptures. What's he saying? If you want certainty, do not look to visions or experiences or all that religions seem to want. You look to the word of God. The prophecy of scripture, he calls it in verse 20. Why? Visions experiences all need interpretation. They all need to be interpreted. Oh, you saw what on a mountain? Well, what does that mean? The word of God needs no interpretation because the word of God is clearly doing what God declares he is doing. The big difference is that we don't interpret Holy Scripture. It interprets us. Look at Peter. When Jesus spares Peter of the mythology of having to talk about his experiences, he lifts Peter up to simply point again to the word of God and say, Jesus Christ has done this. When we stand over our visions and, interpret and our, our experiences and we interpret them, even when we stand and try to stand over scripture to interpret them, you know what's going to happen. Interpretations will vary. But Peter says, you turn to Holy Scriptures, the prophetic word, because what does God's word do? God's word does what God's word says. Holy Scripture, says Peter, shines a light upon us. It is like a light in darkness. Well, 
You read Scripture. And when you don't interpret it, it will, though, interpret you. The first thing it will do is shine a light upon yourself. This we don't like. Because when a light is shown upon us, the first thing that shows is all the darkness we try to hide from others as well as from ourselves. It's now brought to the light of day to be seen, to be declared, this is your sin. This is your bondage. This is your death. And the wages of sin is death. But God's word interprets us, and the first interpretation it gives us is sinner. But also the light of Holy Scripture is the light of Jesus Christ himself. And in Jesus Christ himself, we are given a risen Savior who comes and says, rise and have no fear. You are now forgiven. Is this true? This interpretation of us, first as sinner and next as forgiven in Christ. Is this certain? What vision is going to tell you this? Every vision is open to interpretation. And interpretations will vary. But you see, this is not a vision. This is not an experience. This is the word of the Lord. And this is what the mountain was saying. Here is my beloved son, who I am well pleased. Listen to him. So that when they lift up their eyes, they see Jesus only. We are left not to live by our visions, our experiences, our events of life, to interpret all of them however it is we want to interpret them. We are reinterpreted by God's word as it is spoken to us. We are reinterpreted to be made new. And to be made believers, faithfully hearing and knowing this is most certainly true. And that is freed from all interpretation. It is just declared for you to hear and for you to believe. Amen.